Button 1. You will hear a conversation between a psychiatrist in the medical center of the college and a new student. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 4. Now listen carefully to the conversation and answer questions 1 to 4. Hello, sit down please. Thank you. Now, you are a new patient, aren't you? Y yes, that's right. OK, so I'd better get some basic details down first. Right, we'll start with your name. Martin Hansen. Do you spell that S-O-N or S-E-N? H-A-N-S-E-N. OK, and you're a first year student? Yes, I am. Study in? Uh, electronics, actually. Ah, I hope you enjoy it. Thanks. And your address? Uh, 2805 Hesperian Avenue, Hayward. 2805 and Hesperian. Yes, that's H-E-S-P-E-R-I-A-N. Hayward, H-A-Y-W-A-R-D. And your phone number? 734-246-55. 734-246-55. No, you've got the six and the four the wrong way round. It's two, four, six, five, five. Huh? Sorry. Right. And um, when were you born? Ah, uh, the 15th of June, 1986. Here in New Zealand? No, I was born in Sydney. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen to the conversation and answer questions 5 to 10. Good. So, what's your problem? Well, frankly, I wonder whether it is a problem. I get the blues, and it lasts for quite a while. I don't know how to... Yes, we all feel sad or get the blues now and again. Generally, our sadness lessens in time and with the support of friends. However, if the depression leads to difficulty in thinking and greatly disrupts your daily routine, it can be evidence of a psychiatric problem. What do you feel exactly? I always feel sad and worthless. I find it hard to fall asleep and wake up early in the morning. How long has it lasted? Nearly half a month. Do you feel fatigue or loss of energy? Or you may have lost interest or pleasure in usual activities? Yes, sometimes. At first I thought I could overcome it by myself, but I failed. And I'm that... so glad that you came here. It seems that you are suffering mild depression from your symptoms. Depression? Yes, I feel depressed sometimes. But why would I... Depression may occur as a result of biochemical changes in the body. Alcohol, amphetamines, cocaine and LSD can bring on depression. Those who have a family history of depression usually have a greater risk of depression. Sometimes the worrying changes in life can lead to depression. I see. I had a really bad breakup of a love relationship. It makes me feel hopeless. Do you think I need some treatment? Yes. Antidepressant medications are often used to treat depression, if it is serious. But I don't suggest them at first because of the side effects. I suggest psychotherapy, which can give you support and help you regain control. So do I need to come here every day? No, I will arrange counselling sessions for you, which will last 12 to 20 weeks. You come here once or twice each week. The psychotherapy is directed at helping you gain insight and understanding about events in your life, which may have contributed to your depression. With growing insight, you can often learn more effective ways of coping with your feelings and changing your behaviour. What can I do to take care of myself? Well, at first you should do some physical exercises on a regular basis, at least three times a week. How is your food? Do you eat well? Mm, yes, I think so. I eat at my homestay family. Good. 
Find a hobby or a positive recreational activity to participate in once or twice a week. I know it's difficult for you, though. When you feel it's hard to overcome the depression, come to the counseling session. Remember, ask for help if the load is too heavy to handle. Yes, I'll try. So, when will my counseling session begin? I'm going to arrange that for you. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section two. In this section, you'll hear an introduction about ancient architectures. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to twenty. Now listen carefully to the tape and answer questions eleven to twenty. The architecture of the ancients often reflects the ideas and beliefs of that time. Some of the ancient structures can give us a glimpse into the minds of the people who built them. Now, Professor Francis is going to talk to us about ancient architecture. No story is more interesting or impressive than the story of architecture. And in particular, the activities of human beings in the art of building. Let's have a look at this in some detail. Did you ever visit the pyramids? Look at this picture, please. The pyramids in Egypt are true wonders of the ancient world. Khufu's pyramid is a stunning 138 meter high mass of 2.3 million stones, each weighing about 2.5 tons. It was built to geometrical perfection. Over four thousand five hundred years ago, with simple stone and copper tools, it was so far advanced that some have suggested it was designed by aliens. Actually, there is an astronomical significance to the perfect precision of the pyramids. By using two stars that circle the sky polar point, Egyptian astronomers were able to arrange the pyramids due north. This was done because they believed the king's afterlife and the stars were closely related. They believed their pharaoh, that is, their king, had been transformed into another living being, a light in the sky in contrast to the darkness of death. Okay, now let's look at another picture. On this picture is Athens' ancient Parthenon. It is an immense columned temple built almost entirely of marble. Athens' ancient Parthenon is a perfect model of classic Greek architecture. It was built to honor Athena, the goddess of wisdom. Therefore, it includes the ideals of logic and reason in its design. Built in the fifth century BC, the Parthenon is made up of almost 140 columns. The Greeks associated the columns with the virtues of a human being: strong, orderly, proud, and beautiful. The height and width of the Parthenon are designed with the rational logic of geometry. The upper diameter of each column is a bit narrower than its base. It bulges slightly in the middle and slants inward. This kind of optical illusion makes the columns appear more graceful and thus more beautiful. The Parthenon also symbolizes democracy. Each column supports the entire structure, just as each person contributes to the government. It symbolizes that Athens' government is democratic. Finally, I am going to introduce the Roman Colosseum, a large oval structure for public sports events, entertainment, or assemblies. 
The Roman Colosseum displays the practical nature and political thinking of Romans. The Colosseum was built in 80 A.D. when, throughout its vast empire, Romans' population and wealth were growing. It was necessary for politicians to entertain the people in return for their support. Gladiators would battle wild animals, and even one another, in order to entertain the bloodthirsty crowds. Constructed with tons of marble, the Colosseum stood 48 meters high. It has the capacity to hold up to 50,000 spectators. Spectators sat on the lower three levels, surrounded by towering roofed passageways. On hot days, a cover suspended from the top story provided shade from the sun. Ancient architecture gives us a sense of the different societies that build these amazing monuments. Through it, we can imagine what life was like when those civilizations were flourishing. That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section three. In this section, you'll hear an interview on IQ tests. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to thirty. Now, listen carefully to the interview and answer questions twenty-one to thirty. Mrs. Kellerman, a specialist in child psychology, is interviewed by Bridget. Mrs. Kellerman, why is it that some children perform much better than others at school? Obviously, it can't be denied that certain children are brighter than others, but it's not as simple as that. A lot of emphasis is placed on intelligence measured by tests, so-called IQ tests. Which only measure certain types of intelligence, such as, basically, linguistic and numerical skills, or reading and mathematics, to put it plainly, which is unfortunate because some children are bound to suffer. A good example was a friend of mine's son who was kept out of the top class at school because of his average IQ. That's around one hundred. His father, though he had no idea his son was going to be an architect. Always said he was a clever child. Apparently, he was able to picture things in his mind and draw accurately at a very early age. The point is that his university life might not have been so difficult if his ability had been recognized sooner. What you're saying then is that some children have abilities that are not easy to measure, that aren't appreciated by many schools. Precisely. And if these schools are not spotted sufficiently early, they cannot be developed. That's why, in my view, there are so many unhappy adults in the world. They are not doing the things they are best at. What are those other kinds of intelligence? How can we recognize them in our children? Well, take musical talent. Many children never get the chance to learn to play an instrument. But while they might not become great artists or composers, They may get a lot of pleasure and satisfaction. Musically gifted children are fascinated by all kinds of sounds, car horns, animal noises, and so on, and they can easily recognize tunes and sing them in key. How can a parent encourage them? Sing to them and teach them new songs. Buy a piano or even a cheap instrument such as a recorder. If you can afford it, send them to music lessons as soon as possible. Play recordings of different instruments to them. What about a child who is good at sport? Could that be described as a form of intelligence? Most certainly, we psychologists call it motor or bodily intelligence. These children move gracefully and handle objects skillfully. 
A child who finds it easy to take things apart and use various tools may well become an engineer with the right encouragement. We should give them models to make and take them to science museums. However, unless these children are also good with words and numbers, they will probably not do well in school examinations. Is there anything a parent can do to help in this case? Yes, it may be worth spending money on private lessons, but you know, hardly anyone is good at everything. In my opinion, a child should be judged on his individual talents. After all, being happy in life is putting your skills to good use, no matter what they are. That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section four. In this section, you'll hear an introduction about the tutorial courses of the physics school. First, you have some time to read questions thirty-one to forty-two. Now listen carefully to the tape and answer questions thirty-one to forty-two. Welcome to orientation week. This is the physics school session, and we'll welcome Professor Smith, the head of the school, to introduce you to the tutorial system. Welcome, Professor Smith. Thank you. You may have noticed life at university is totally different from that of school. For you, tutorials are an important part of the teaching program. Tutors are the primary contact between undergraduate students and the school. A tutor is the student's personal tutor as well as their academic tutor. Tutorials for physics undergraduates consist of six students who meet each week with their tutor for at least fifty minutes. For radiographer students. Tutorials will normally consist of a group of about ten students who will meet fortnightly with their tutor for a period of at least fifty minutes. In the first semester, the tutorials are during weeks one to eleven. For semester two, they are during weeks fourteen to twenty-four. Everybody involved is expected to be present and on time. And the tutor will also be available in week twelve and twenty-five to discuss problems that arise during revision. But attendance by students is optional. Now I'm going to introduce to you the stages and activities of the tutorials. The induction period is from week one to three. I know that a significant minority of you experience culture shock. During your first few months at university, and the important function of this stage is to identify students who are having difficulty integrating into the academic program. In particular, tutors should check your attendance of lectures, tutorials, laboratory sessions, and this sort of things. Tutors also help you tackle work in a systematic and effective manner. Stage two begins from the fourth week. Some tutorials of this period are to be devoted to discussion or going over the students' lecture notes, but approximately fifty percent of tutorial time is to be devoted to coursework. You should finish the weekly homework assignments of two hours duration with at least fifty percent involving written work. At least eight homework assignments during the year should involve answering problems set on coursework. The written work collected by the tutor. Should be marked within a week of handing in, and generally the assignments should be graded. 
The third stage starts from week eight till the tenth. During this period, math and four core physics programs are included. The majority of tutorial time should be devoted to work which supports the lecture programs and laboratory work. At least sixty percent of homework assignments should involve written work. The assignment may involve writing an account of or notes on a specified range of topics. The written work should also be marked and graded. Short oral presentations by students should be included. They are possibly on general physics topics or essays. The last week's personal development planning is a structured and supported process. The primary objective for PDP is to help you to become more independent and confident, self-directed learners, and encourage a positive attitude to learning throughout life. It is undertaken by yourselves to reflect upon their own learning, performance, and achievement, and to plan for their personal, educational, and career development. Finally. If, without evidence of good reason, you miss more than two sessions during a semester, or if the tutor is not satisfied with your progress, the matter must be immediately referred to the program director, who will normally issue formal warning, verbal and written. This will inform you that your place at university is under threat of withdrawal if no improvement is made. That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.